are now recording, and we'll go to the current slide. And before we get started on that, let me go over this couple of things. I've got a test in already this morning, which was great news to see. Uh, but this is just a reminder. If any of you were, or if you know someone who is in a first mini term course, the student course evaluations, I think, are still open. I don't know where they're going to close them, but they're open right now. This is only for first many term courses. So if you know of anyone who fits this bill, you yourself or someone else, be sure to let them know we really need these student course evaluations. They're very valuable to us. Okay? The other thing this implies, and this is, as I said, I got another test in today, which is good news. I need a score for everybody because sometime, probably this week, they'll ask for midterm progress reports. And of course, if I have no scores, you have no grade, and that would be classified a failure at midterm. And those I have to report. These are now for midterm. So I'm just missing, actually, I don't think I'm missing any now because I think I got my first, first, get that first paper in, research paper in last week. Uh, but it was emailed to me, so I haven't been able to print it off yet because when I saw that I had it, I didn't have a printer attached, so I couldn't print it. So I think maybe now I have a grade from everybody, if I can get that that one, okay? Uh, so please keep work coming in. We're not too far off from being second test time. Okay, any questions before we get going today? Okay. Um, we're waiting to start class until somebody got here, but now I guess we can go on. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. What's that? Oh, I see. Is that what it is? I thought it was a, a uh, dirge that never run. Okay. Um, we're in Chapter 3, Differentiation, uh, 3.5, Implicit Differentiation, and... We're combining two things here, implicit differentiation and logarithmic differentiation, and that's what we're doing with example 10. So here's our problem. Find the derivative of, oh well, I think I forgot to mark this latecomer in. Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. Council. Okay. Middle part of the alphabet is doing quite well now. And the lower part's not doing too badly. The upper part, one person's here, and that's all. Okay, you're holding up the whole half of the class here. All right, find the derivative of that. Ooh, boy. Do we have a rule that applies to something like that? Any ideas? Do not take the derivative of x to the 2x. Now, a little bit of you might say the power rule. Well, the power rule works if the exponent is a number, but not necessarily if it's a variable. So no, it doesn't. And this is where the logarithmic differentiation comes into play. Okay? That sort of gives you a hint what you think you might do first. Take the log of both sides of the equation. Okay? So let's do that. Get my pen set up. There we go. Now, of course, this one's the left-hand side will just be log y. We're taking the natural log of both sides of the equation. And what about the right-hand side? Okay, now, time out for just a moment. Just want to do that. What we're looking for is y prime dy dx, okay, just to remind you of that, okay. Right hand side, what would that become? If you take the log of both sides, that would be, give it to me somebody, it's really easy, the log of the right hand side, x to the 2x, that was not too bad, was it? Okay. Now, uh, I guess I should do another timeout here. I guess you know, well, maybe you don't know. 
It's not intuitively obvious yet why x has to be greater than 0. Or maybe it is. Especially after we just did here. Um, x certainly can't be 0, can it? Because 0 to the 0 power is not defined. So that's why, uh, that's certainly why the, even the first line could not be 0 because 0 to the 0 power is not defined. But there wasn't anything necessarily that said it couldn't be negative. Okay? This says it can't be, and we'll see that in the next step, I think. Okay, just bring down your log y. Now, using your rules for logarithm, how can you rewrite the right-hand side? Anyone want to make a stab? 2x times the log of x. Perfect, perfect. And now you see why x can't be negative either, All right? Because you can't take the log of the negative number. You can't take the log of zero. But we already eliminated zero, so that's why x has to be greater than zero for this problem to work. If that wasn't, hang it up, you can't take the derivative. Okay? So, anyway, we've done that. Now we've got things somewhat manageable. What do you think we need to do now? What's the question asking us to do? Take a derivative. Before that, we couldn't, we didn't have a rule to, to handle that. Now that we've done this, we can take a derivative of both sides. What is the derivative of the left-hand side? Anyone remember that one? Okay, anyone remember what the derivative of the log in general is? Okay, that was close. Uh, okay, what? No, go ahead. I didn't mean to stifle your creativity there, okay? It's the derivative of log. Make a guess. Go on. If it was log x, what's the derivative of log x? Uh, need to go back a few sections, huh? Okay. Let's see. Was it M three one? It wasn't M three two, I don't think. No, it seems like oh yes, here we go. Here we go. thought we went. One over x. All right, finally it came through. Okay, so if that's a y though, what would that be? Okay, certainly it'll be a one over y, but then what else do you have to do with a y? General. General. What's that? Derivative of y would be y prime, so that would be in the numerator. So the derivative of any old thing is uh, the derivative of the thing over the thing, okay? y prime over y, okay? So that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side, what kind of rule do we need to use there? Product rule, and how does that go? There's a couple ways you could do it. You pick your way, let me know what it is. 
first times the derivative of the second, so that would be 2x times 1 over x. Hey, choop, choop, the x's go out there. Notice the sound effects, okay? Then what? Plus, which is 2 times log x. You got it, okay? So here's what we got so far. y prime over y is equal to, here the x's went out, so you just have 2, you have a 2 over there too, so you could say 2 times 1 plus log x. Now you don't have to write it that way, I just did. Okay, but we're really not that interested in what y prime over y is. What do we want to know? Just y prime. So what could we do? Multiply both sides of the equation by... by y, okay, it rhymes, okay, I'll just put the y in there, okay, so now we have y prime, but since the right hand side has that y there, we don't need to write the y, we could just write in what y is, 2, that's the 2 from there, y is x to the 2x times 1 plus log x, there it is explicitly described here, okay? You don't have any Y's on the right-hand side just yet. Let's see how they did. Oh, look at that. They got it right. Good for them, okay? Any questions on that? You see the steps, the procedure, and more importantly, why we do those steps and do that procedure. Yay? All right, let's clear my... Unless someone's still writing, I'll let you write. Is this making sense? Okay, how do you eat that 5,000 pound elephant? One bite at a time. So just take it step at a time, making sure you understand those steps and see if you can get to. Remember what you're going for, Y prime. So do what it takes to get there. All right, to erase, you're going to see it all again. Maybe not quite in the same order, but I bet awfully close. Note that y is positive for all x's that are positive. Okay? And we said that x has to be positive. See, if x were negative and 2, to the x, two times x would be negative, and then you'd have a negative number raised to a negative power, that's 1 over a negative number raised to that power, if that power wasn't exactly even, then that denominator is going to be negative. But if that x is positive, then this thing is positive, that means the y is positive, so since the y is positive, you can take log y. That's what enabled us to do the first step. Uh, if y is equal to x to the 2x, and we are told that x is positive, that means you can take the log of both sides, X can't be zero, only positive, so Y would be positive, can't be zero. So then you can take the log of both sides, and log of Y is equal to log of X to the 2X. But then using our rules for logarithms, that log Y would be equal to 2X times log X, exactly like y'all got, that enables us to now take a derivative. And when you do that, the derivative of log Y is Y prime over Y. 1 over y times the derivative of y, okay? So that's y prime over y, and then product rule here, 2x times the derivative of log x, plus 2 times log x. Here, those x's go out, and that leaves us with y prime over y is 2 times 1 plus log x, exactly what we got, then multiply both sides by y. Why not? And then, since y is a function of x, you could go on and substitute that in and do 2 to the x to the 2x, which is exactly what y was, times 1 plus. Any questions?
pretty good problem. And it shows you how sometimes taking the log first enables you to do something that you just don't do. A really nasty derivative. That will sort of simplify. So remember what logs do? They drop things down a notch. That's how I look at it. Maybe not a good mathematical way of saying it, but it sounds more like you know or with somebody. But never mind. You wouldn't know who that was. All right. Um, I usually just skip these concept checks. Always look at the concept checks. I, I don't say you have to do anything with them, but it's a pretty good review of what it's, that uh, section was just talking about. But once you've done that, then the homework exercises are any of the odds, 5 through 25. They all account chat, 5's account view. 27 or 29, or both, they're both account chat, 29's account view. 31, any of the odds, 31 to 37. Excuse me, all at count chat, 31's at count view. Uh, 39 or 41, both at count chat, 39's at count view. 43 or 40, uh, anyway, any of the odds, 43 to 47, they go to the next page. They're all at count chat, 45's at count view. Uh, then any of the odds, uh, either 49 or 51, they're both at count chat. You can explore doing 53. Um, that's up to you. I don't know if they're at Couch Chat or not. If they are, go for it. 55 should be at Couch Chat. 57 is both at Couch Chat and Couch View. 59 or 61 are both at Couch Chat, 61 being at Couch View. 63 is at Couch Chat, 65 is at Couch Chat. And here they sort of introduce a new concept to you. Um, a little bit, but I'll leave that alone for now. Uh, then 67 is a count chat. Um, any of the odds 69 to 79, this I think would be new problems I didn't assign before. They're all at count chat. 71 is a count view. 81 or 83 should both be a count chat. Okay. And again, that's sort of a new concept here, so you might want to read that. And then 85 is a count chat. And 87 is a true false. Okay? 89 is a count chat. And by the way, 87 should be too. Uh, 91 should be a count chat. So I would say either 89 or 91. 93 should be a count chat. So maybe any of the odds 89 through 93. Or 95. Yeah. Any of the odds 89 through 95. There is a section project at the bottom of page 177 uh, sort of optical illusion type thing you're certainly welcome to look and play with that if you'd like all right any questions 3.5 uh, moving now to 3.6 and i think what we'll do is just sort of go through this one pretty quickly i'm not certain that i'll be asking you any uh, putting any of questions of this on your your test, uh, but I wanted to at least expose you to this so you have seen it before. These are can be sort of pains in the neck. There's a procedure to use. We'll go through that procedure, but we'll move on to 3.7 pretty quickly. I did think of this. I remember last week, I think I had just returned from my hematologist, and I told you I was very anemic. I went by, I had a dermatology appointment on Friday, I think I told you about, and I went by to pick up the blood work from Tuesday because it wasn't ready when I was there on Tuesday. And when I got it, I also found out my immunoglobulins, there's three of them, IgG, IgM, and one more, IgA or something, like that. no, that's a grocery chain, something else. Uh, those are your immune system markers. And they're all really low, too, so um, it wasn't a very good report. You know, I didn't have that part Tuesday. Um, and therefore, things like hand sanitizers, I would appreciate it. You know, y'all do as much as you can. My wife says keep a distance between people, so fine. It's really great that Jonah just put the test on my desk and left. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
Uh, my immune system has been weakened by this last round of chemo as well. So anyway, and that quite often happens. I don't know if it's, they're any lower now than they've been before, but it's not good news. And with the coronavirus spreading like it is, there could be times when uh, the boss says, you're not going in today. <laughs> so I, uh, you may have to be watching videos and, uh, and if we could do things like, I guess FaceTime would be more appropriate for y'all. Can y'all all do that or not? You can? Okay. No. Uh, how about Skype? Can you do that? Okay. So uh, it might be we. I'm hoping this won't come to this. Uh, but it could be that we might have to Skype a few lessons or something like that. But the, uh, the videos are out there. The trouble with this class and the videos, the videos are from the previous book, not this book. So, uh, but after this chapter, most of the videos will be much more similar. They may have different chapter numbers, but they'll be more similar. Okay. Any questions before we move on to 3.5? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Didn't realize there was something else in this chapter. Ah, paragraph at the bottom of page 174. Here are some guidelines for using logarithmic differentiation. I think we've already done them. In general, use logarithmic differentiation when you're differentiating one, a function that involves many factors, like those that have many things as a numerator, many things as a denominator, or some I think there's example nine. Real pain in the neck to try to do a, a quotient rule or something like that. Use log it, uh, because remember a log will take that quotient and make it a subtraction, and take those multiplications and make them additions. And things are much easier to do this. Or number two, this is the one like we just did, a function having both a variable base x, for instance, our last one, and a variable exponent raised to the 2x. Those, there's hardly any way to do it except logarithmic differentiation. The first one's here, that makes it much, much easier. The second, that's not the only way you can go. So those are the two instances where log differentiation is usually a very good idea. Especially if it's y is equal to something. So the derivative of uh, the log of y and then the derivative of the log y is y prime over y and then you just have to remember that last step multiplying back through by y. All right, that now was the end of 3.5. About ditched it before I saw there was one more slide. So let's do 3.6. And for you, those of you who do have the older book, that stuff was probably in chapter 5 of that, I believe. I don't know what section numbers, but you know, that's where you go to look. And if you're looking at YouTube videos, though I'll be deleting those, uh, well, some of those anyway, you'll find them there too. All right, so let's do 3.6. We'll go from current slide. We're still in Chapter 3, Differentiation. Okay. 3.6 is derivatives of inverse functions. And again, we're going to try to just sort of go through this as a slideshow. Uh, the objectives of this section are to find the derivatives of an inverse function, okay? And we'll differentiate an inverse trigonometric function, okay? So first we'll do the generic, the general inverse function, and here's what we do with that. The next two theorems discuss the derivatives of an inverse function. First of these is continuity and differentiability of inverse functions. If f is a function whose domain is such interval i, if f has an inverse function, then the following statements have to be true. For f to have an inverse function, the, the following statements have to be true. If f is continuous on its domain, okay, which I think it almost has to be, then f inverse is also continuous on its domain, okay? 
Now, what you might or might not remember is the domain of F and F inverse don't always have to be the same. The domain of F inverse is the range of F, and the domain of F is the range of F inverse. If it has an inverse function, then that's true. Number two, if F is differentiable on an interval containing C, and F prime of C is not zero, not zero, then F inverse is differentiable also at F of C. It's not if the derivative of F was the derivative of F of C was zero. I'm just going to do a little arm waving here. Okay? If you remember, we're going to get to it later, the sine function goes like this, right? And remember, only this portion of it has an inverse because it has to be one to one. But up here at this point, at uh, pi halves, that derivative is zero there. If you were to do the inverse function, I hope you remember this, it starts down here and goes like that. With this point, which is now the domain here is one, which ranges to their pi halves, that is an infinite. Because this was a zero derivative, that would be an infinite derivative there. So therefore, if f prime of c is zero, f inverse does not have a derivative, is not differentiable at c. I hate this because these are different c's, okay? Uh, they're not being very precise here, okay? Uh, well, wait. No, they said it right. F inverse is differentiable at f of c. That would be the, the y value of this is the x value, the, the input of that. Okay, so there's the first one. The next one. What is the derivative of an inverse function? Let f be a function that is differentiable on an interval i. If f has an inverse function g, if it does have an inverse function g, I'm not calling it f inverse now, I don't know why, but g, then g is also differentiable at any value of x for which f prime of g of x is not zero. Okay? We basically kind of said that before, it seems. Okay? Uh, not quite. We didn't quite get there, but came close. Moreover, what is this g prime then? That's the question. g prime is then 1 over f prime, which is its inverse, evaluated at g at this same value. Okay? That is as long as this f inverse, I mean f prime, is not equal to zero. f prime of g of x is not equal to zero. Okay? So there is the derivative of the inverse function. 1 over the derivative of its inverse evaluated at the same value there. Okay. The reasonableness of that first one follows here, it's kind of what I said before. Um, here's a function f of x. Now they showed a much more bizarre function f of x than I did, but it still works, okay? And here's the, the issue with this one. This looks like it's some cubic function, which does have a zero derivative here, okay? Well, if you do the inverse function of that, that gives it a, an infinite derivative there. Okay? So, um, it can have derivatives here and here, everywhere else, but right there and right there, no. Um, because the derivative of this one zero is negative, and the derivative of that one is infinite. Okay? The graph of f prime is a reflection of the graph of f across the line y is equal to x. Okay? Here where they have the same values. Now I just want to you probably remember this from earlier. If this is an increasing function, this is an increasing function and vice versa. Okay? And they always have to reflect results back. Notice it has to be a one-to-one -one function 
It can't back up on itself anywhere. It couldn't have come up here, gone down, and back up, then horizontal line pass back. That has to be monotonic, either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. Must have a derivative everywhere, except when this has a zero derivative, makes it have a infinite derivative back. Okay. <coughs> so here's example one. Oh, this may not be too bad. Let's try it. What is the value of f inverse of x when x is equal to 3? Well, what do we know about... Oh, this is not a derivative involved here. What is the value of f of x when f... Okay, here's f of x. Let me get my pen set up. I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it. When x equal 3, what is f of x? We don't even have to do that. Let's just think for a moment. Oh, that would hurt, wouldn't it? Okay. Uh, what is the value of f inverse of x when x is equal to 3? Wait, no, no, I think we will not to do it. All right. Here's the problem. They have an x up here. This x is not the same as that x. That's the problem here. Okay? So, I'm going to check and see what they're going to do here. In fact, this is why I'm skipping this section. Because I think they're a little sloppy on their nomenclature. Let's just see what they say the answer is. My first result would say, put an x in here, see what this value is and then do an f inverse of that, but that would be at a different value. So, what basically what you have to do is find f inverse of this function. And that's not impossible to do, but it does take a, a bit of effort. Okay? So let's just watch them do it. Okay? Note that f is a one-to-one -one function and therefore ha has an inverse function. Yeah. And that's because that x to the third power is x not x minus 7 to the third power. Is, well, that would still be okay. Okay? Now, here's the part they just do the magic on. And this is what aggravates me. They say because alpha 2 is equal to 3. Well, how do you know that? Okay? You would have to just start plugging in numbers to see what would give you a 3 there. And that's a pain in the neck to do most of the time. Here it probably wouldn't take you more than five times to get there. But, yeah. But, sure enough, if you plug in a 2 there, 2 cubed is 8. And a quarter of 8 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4 minus 1 is 3. Yeah, that's right. But how would you know that just looking at that problem? You would. They make it seem so easy, but you would have to do... I wouldn't have started stuck there. I, if anything, I would have started it well. F of 0 would be negative 1. F of 1 would be a fraction. <laughs> I don't like that one. Uh, and maybe I've done an F of minus 1 or whatever. But then finally, maybe I would have gotten the alpha 2. Hey, that's equal to 3. Well, if alpha 2 is equal to 3, f inverse of 3 is equal to 2. So that's the answer to the first one. I can't tell you what insight made them do that except they knew that's the answer. And that bugs me about this book sometimes. Okay? Now, what is the value of alpha prime of x when x is equal to 3? Okay, that's what we, and I'm just going to let them show you how to do this. That's what we just did on that second theorem, is this. Because the function is differential and has an inverse function, you can apply that theorem to it with g equal f inverse. 
So f inverse of 3 would be 1 over f of f inverse of 3. Okay. Well, f of f inverse, no, I'm sorry, f prime of f inverse uh, of 3. And still, yeah, I don't like the way they're doing this, but let's go on and see what they do. Is f inverse of 3 is 2 from what we just did. So what is 1 over f prime of 2? Well, now you have to go back to the f function, which we have, and do its derivative. So let's go back and do that real quickly. That we can do. F prime, to answer the second question, you need to know this. What is F prime? Please tell me you know. It's what? Well, tell me what F prime of X is. All that difficult, is it? Exponent times coefficient. Help me, somebody. Isn't that three fourths? Three times one fourth is three fourths. X to the second power plus. derivative of x. Say again? One. Got it. All right. So there's f prime of x. What we want to know is what f prime of 2 is, right? Yes. We want to know what f prime of 2 is. Okay. Well, let's go back here and do f prime of 2 would be 3 quarters times what's 2 squared? Second, 4 plus 1 and that would be 3 plus 1 equal 4. So f prime of 2 is 4 so f prime of 2, 1 over f prime of 2 would be 1 4. Okay? Let's see if that's what they get. Moreover, using, and here they go back and do that, you can conclude that that is that, and that would be 1 over that, which is 1 fourth. Good for them. Okay? And then they drew the graphs, which, I don't know. Okay. Here is the L function. Pretty steep slope there, 4, but the inverse function, Still has to be positive because increasing, increasing, uh, but now this looks is one fourth, one over instead of two. So sure enough, one fourth. I didn't mean to take that long with it, but that's what we got. Now, in example one, note that at the point two three, okay, the slope of the graph of m is one fourth. And at the point 3, 2, the slope of the out inverse is 1 fourth. Okay? That reciprocal relation that follows from theorem 317 is sometimes written this way. This is so much easier to remember. dy dx is equal to 1 over dx dy. Oh! Why didn't you say that in the first place? Okay? 1 over dx dy. And that almost looks like that would make sense, doesn't it? If you multiply both of the sides, if you treated this as a fraction, which it isn't, it's an operator, but that would be 1 over dx dy. Yeah. Okay. When determining the derivative of an inverse function, you have two options. Either apply a theorem 3.17 or use implicit differentiation. Okay? Now, their example 2 is going to do that. Okay? 
Um, I'm going to let you do that. I think you'll find it easier to do it the second way, but I'll let you determine that, okay? Example three, I think, also will be doing that, but that's using an inverse tangent function, which we haven't gotten to until we get to this next section. So I'll let you look at those if you wish. And let's go on to derivatives of inverse trigonometric functions. You know that the derivative of the transcendental function, alpha of x equals log x, is the algebraic function, l prime of x is equal to 1 over x. Yeah, we knew that from today, right? You will now see that the derivative of the sum of the inverse functions, see that the derivative of the inverse trigonometric functions are also algebraic, even though the inverse trigonometric functions are themselves transcendental. Their derivatives are algebraic. Okay? Just like this is a transcendental function, so its derivative is an algebraic function. Same thing for the inverse trig function. The following theorem lists the derivatives of six inverse trigonometric functions. Note that the derivatives of arc cosine u, arc tangent u, uh, arc cotangent u, and arc cosecant u are the negatives of the derivatives of arc sine, arc tangent, and arc secant. Okay? In other words, they have the same value of the opposite sign. But if you remember that the derivatives of sine, tangent, and secant are all positive, and the derivatives of the cosine, cotangent, and cosecant are all negative, but other than that, they look similar, if not quite the same. So here's what we've got. d by dx, so I'm saying that, of arc sine u would be u prime over derivative of 1 minus u squared. All right. Now, is there an easy way to remember this? I don't think so. Except, here's how I remember it, and it basically comes sort of from this. Uh, remember that sine and cosine are related by sine squared x plus cosine squared x, or sine squared u plus cosine squared u is equal to 1. So if you were solving for, uh, it's wrong about, but if you wanted, say, cosine u then, you do the square root of 1 minus <coughs> sine u, okay? Sine squared u. So that's where, not that they have anything to do with each other, but they are similar. That's where the square root of 1 minus u squared. That's how I remember that tells us sine and cosine relationship. And same thing here, it tells us this is negative. Okay? Our tangent u, if you remember, tangent is related to secant by 1 plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared. Remember that one? Well, a 1 plus u squared would then be not with the square root, because 1 plus u squared is what you use for our tangent in your denominator, u prime in the numerator. And then cotangent would just be a minus u. Same thing. Now, all things fall apart with the secrets and co secrets. I can't think of any easy way to do this uh, except that secret squared x is tangent squared minus 1. So this has a u squared minus 1, but you go back under a radical here. You didn't have the radical here. So that throws that off a little bit, but it's still okay. Uh, But then this absolute value of u in front, you just got to remember it. It's just there. Uh, so it'll be there in this one as well. And there's every other one. Not something I sit down and memorize. If I need them, I'm going to look them up. And frankly, that's what I would say do for this whole section. If you need the stuff, look it up and then do what? Yeah, go look it. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, there is no common agreement on the definition of arc secant and arc cosecant for negative values of x. For this section, the range of arc secant was defined to preserve the reciprocal identity this way. Um, for example, to 
uh, evaluate R secant of negative 2, you You have to go through gyrations. Um, and frankly, how I would suggest doing this, set this equal to some angle theta, okay? And that says that secant theta is equal to minus 2. That means 1 over cosine of theta is equal to 1 over 2. So, uh, so you, you're just going through all sorts of things. But yeah, you do get an answer that way. But these are mess. They're just totally messy. So, uh, if you ever need them, go back and look them up. Okay. Uh, one of the consequences of the, def of the definition of inverse secant function given in this section is that its graph has a positive slope at every x value in its domain. But you have to figure out what this domain. This accounts for the absolute value sign. In the point of the derivative of log secant. Okay. Not so much for, yeah, also for the negative sign of R cosecant. But they're messy. They're just messy, and that's why I don't mess with them. So I'll just let you see how they did this. Uh, remembering, you start with u prime up here, so that's just the 2 where that came from, and then the in the denominator, the square root of 1 minus the argument squared. Okay. That's the derivative of arc cosine. I mean, arc sine. And it's positive. Okay. And you just square the second function. I mean, the second expression. Arc tangent is the derivative of this 3 over 1 plus the square. No square root in, in tangent and cosecant, but arc tangent. That would just turn out 9 x squared. Okay? Arc sine of a 1 half, uh, x of 1 half. That's how I would write this. Derivative of x of the 1 half is 1 half times x to the minus 1 half. And then divide that by uh, the square root of 1 minus this thing squared, which would just be x. Okay. Now, what makes this a little stranger, this 2 comes down here, and the x of the minus 1 half can come down here, so you have the square root of x down here. Well, the square root of x times square root of 1 minus x is the square root of x minus x squared. Which is what they are going to do. Well, not quite. The 2 came down, the square root of x came down, you just have 1 left up top, and when you multiply that together, it's 1 over 2 times the square root of x minus x squared. That's what that looks like. Okay? Strange but true. Uh, the D one, now we have that arc secret, which you never mess with arc secrets anyway. But if you do, then this. Well, the root of this is e to the 2x times chain rule 2. 2 times e to the 2x. Over the absolute value of e to the 2x, which is e to the 2x, because e to the 2x is always positive, times the square root of e to the 2x squared minus 1. So this is e to the 4x. Uh, Watch how they did it. Yeah. This e to the 2x can cancel, divide out. That means and you're just left with 2 over e to the 4x minus 1. Okay. Again, strange. Okay. The absolute value sign is not necessary because e to the x is always greater than 0. Whoa! That was the end of the section which is sort of surprising. Um, they have an example five, which would be a really sort of interesting one to do, and I'd suggest you probably try to do it. They do a little blurb on Galileo here. Uh, 
he preceded Newton and even his approach uh, basically led to Newton's development of calculus, even though Galileo is not given, he's associated with Newton on more of the science side, less on the mathematics side, but he, even his mathematics, which he needed to do his science, uh, came from that way. And while I was surprised that they did not give on the slide set this basic differentiation rule for elementary functions, uh, they go through all the ones we did, the, the uh, constant derivative of the constant times a function, derivative of the sum or difference of two functions, the product rule, the quotient rule, the derivative of a constant, I would have done that right at the beginning, the, the power rule, the general power rule, uh, then derivative of x is 1, I would have done that right at the beginning, uh, derivative of absolute value, uh, which is interesting, I don't know if you recall that, but uh, then the derivative of log, which we've done several times even today, derivative of exponentials, which we have done several times, including today, derivative of some other log, base other than E, natural log, and just a review of those, same thing, uh, a power or an exponential function, uh, again, reviewing those, and then derivative of your sines, cosine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and cosecant. Then the derivative of the inverse, sines, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Okay. Uh, then they mention a few other as a footnote. Uh, there are some important functions used in engineering and science, which most of you pre-engineers probably are going to run into, uh, and that would be Bessel functions, gamma functions, others like that. They're not even elementary functions, so you have another set of worms to, I mean, things to deal with later. But we'll leave those alone. You can do any of the homework exercises you choose to. I'm not going to test you on these necessarily. Uh, but a good idea to be have been exposed to them so you'll know where to go. Now, the related rates, again, it's a great section, okay? It's a fun section. These are fun problems to do. We just don't have time for them. So what I'm going to do here is, again, just do a slideshow of them. And I'll try to point out the, the key elements here. All right, we'll go from current slide, and we are 11.02, so we've got a fair amount of time left. Um, you may have seen, I uh, hate to sort of bring it up now, something that looks almost like this a lot in the news these days, except they have little, looks like flowerettes coming out of them. That's a lot of files the coronavirus with, except that it has a uh, little, where these just look like flowers implanted on there, these have them popping out, you know, uh, but that's beside the point. Okay, 3.7 is related rates. Again, very much fun problems to work on. And the objectives here are to find the related rate and use related rates to solve some real life problems. So find some related rates. You've seen how the chain rule is used to find dy, dx implicitly. Another important use of the chain rule is to find the rates of change of two or more related variables that are changing with respect to time, which in most of your applications, that's going to be the case. Not always, but in a lot of times it will be. For example, when water is drained out of a conical tank, which, of course, all of us have conical tanks, right? Yeah, one of our favorite kinds. They sit up so well by themselves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the volume, um, the radius, the volume V, the radius R, and the height H of the water level are all functions of the time T. Okay? 
knowing that these variables are related by this equation, and I'm sure you knew this one, V is equal to one-third pi r squared h. Okay? You probably didn't know that, but here's how I remember it. If this were a cylinder rather than a cone, okay, a cylinder, then the the volume of that cylinder is the area of the base, which is a circle, pi r squared times the height, so pi r squared h. And a cone here, even though this is not definitive, it kind of looks like a triangle, doesn't it? It kind of looks like you've divided it into three pieces, and indeed the volume is exactly a third of it. The cylinder, one third pi r squared. That's how I remember it. Not that it's reasonable that way. It's just how I remember. One third pi r squared. I think you'll find this is true for pyramids as well. One third the the uh, volume of whatever rectangular solid that came from. Uh, so, when the height of the water is up here, its volume is much greater than when the height was dropped to here, and much, much greater than when it was dropped to here. More water is spilling out down here, uh, so the volume is related to both the radius, which is getting smaller as you go down, and the height, which of course is getting smaller as you go down. Uh, so the rate at which the volume is changing is related to the rate at which the radius and the height are changing. Well, uh, you can determine implicitly, or differentiate implicitly, with respect to t to obtain those related rate equations. d by dt and d by dt of v, making the derivative with respect to this time here, is d by dt of that equation pi third r squared h, one third pi r squared h. Well, this pi over three comes out, okay? Now, here's what you have left. You have a product here, too. d by dt of r, and r is a function of time. You know, as, as the water is flowing out, the radius is getting smaller and the height is getting smaller, okay? How is it getting smaller? Well, product rule here, right? D by dt, uh, pull out the pi third, okay? Of that product would be r squared times dh dt, and that is, plus h, the second one, times the derivative of this, which is 2r times dr dt, okay? Putting those together again, well, you can do much to put them together again, pi third, R squared uh, dh dt, okay, plus 2 pi r h dr dt. Okay, from that equation you can see how the rate of change of the velocity of the volume is related to the rate of change of the height and the rate of change of the radius. It's right there. Okay, so. The variables x and y are both your principal two functions of t, which is something sort of new we haven't done before, but they are. And they're related by this equation, y is equal to x squared plus 3. Find dy dt, not dy dx. dy dx is easy, right? dy dt, if both y and x are functions of time. So dy dt would be what? Why do you see is the two x squared two x, but because we're taking the root with respect to t, not with respect to x, you have to have a dx dt chain rule because x and y are 
are functions of t. Okay? So the y dt is equal to 2 x times dx dt, and then we throw that away, it's not really equal to 0. So find the y dt when x is equal to 1, given that dx dt is equal to 2 when x is equal to 1. This is really a convoluted problem. They're giving you all the information you just plug in. Then a lot better, say, to giving you what we call the parametric equations where that came from. But here's what we did. Using the chain rule, you can differentiate both sides of your original equation with respect to t, that the y dt is equal to, they're writing it all down, it came out to be 2x dx dt. There it is. Okay? Now they told us when x is equal to 1 and dx dt is equal to 2. You just plug it in. 2 times 1 is 2 times dx dt is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So dy dt is equal to 4. To me, that gives me a whole lot of understanding of what's going on. You just plugged in numbers, which is fine. Okay? That's all they wanted you to do with that one. Now, problems re solving with related rates. This is where it gets to be fun. In example one, you are given an equation with related to that related the variables x and y, and we're asked to find the rate of change, time rate of change when uh, x was equal to one, and they had to give you all the other information. In the next example, you must create the mathematical model from the verbal description. So here's what we've got here. If I don't tear up my pen. Time is it. How are we doing on time? Anyone got the time? Huh? 11 away. 11 away. Okay, we got the time. 20 minutes. 19 minutes. Felt like that. Okay. No, 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes. 49 minutes. Okay. It'll be 28 if I keep talking too long. Okay. A pebble is dropped into a calm pond, causing ripples to form concentric circles, if I can speak, which all in this figure. Okay? The total area increases as the outer radius increases. Total area affected as they move out. The radius R of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. Okay? When the radius is four feet, at what rate is the total area A of the disturbed water changing? A. Oh boy. Well, we know already that the area of a circle, oh, these are circular concentric circles, so these are circles, the area is pi r squared, right? A is equal to pi r squared. So taking that, I wasn't going to do too much on it, but these are sort of fun to do. If you know that, let me get my pen set up. A is equal to pi r squared. We know that, right? So what we're doing is dA dt is equal to pi times, you do the right-hand side. Anybody? I did the left hand side for you. You do the right hand side. Say again? I even did part of the right hand side. I factored out the pi. What's the rest of it? 2 R chain rule dr dt. Okay? Now, if the radius of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second, that's the dr dt. That's how, and here's the, here is, to me, a real big key to this. Pay attention to your units. Feet per second. T is in second, radius in feet. 
So this is your one foot per second is your dr dt. When the radius is four feet, ha, that'll be four now, okay? At what rate is the total area changing? Well, that's the ADT, the rate at which the area is changing. Rate, that usually means time rate, D-A-D-T. So that's what we're looking for. So this will be 2 pi times 4. That would be 8 pi times 1 foot per second. Okay? Um, and this radius is 4 feet. And drdt is feet per second, so it's feet squared per second. So your unit here is feet squared per second, which is a great unit for area, square feet, time, second. 8 pi feet squared, square feet per second. Okay? So here's how the variables are related. If you take your derivative and the Rate of change of the radius, the RDT is 1. I would put the units in there, 1 foot per second. R is measured in feet, times measured in second. So there you have that. Your, yeah, and there they wrote it, the RDT is equal to 1 foot per second. Find the ADT when R is equal to 4 feet. Well, when you take the derivative by the chain rule of your equation there, d a d t is equal to d by d or d by d t of a is equal to d by d t of r squared pi r squared and that would be d a d t which is what you're looking for is equal to two times pi times r which you're going to be looking at four times d r d t which is one so that's four feet times one foot per second that would be eight pi square feet per second d a d t square feet per second works out perfect. Make sense? When the radius is 4 feet, the area is changing at a rate of 4 of 8 pi square feet per second. And the radius is changing at a constant rate. This is changing at a much faster rate. So here's the guidelines for solving related rate problems. Identify all the given quantities and quantities to be determined. Now this is true in all problem solving. Everything that they give you, plus things that you're looking for. If necessary, make a sketch, label the quantity. Sometimes pictures are worth thousands of words. Write an equation involving the variables whose rates of change are either given or to be determined. So if you have something that relates area to radius, write it down, pi r squared. Okay? Using chain rules, implicitly differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to time, because when they're talking about related rates, these are time rates, okay? After completing step three, substitute what you knew and what you're looking for in here, uh, the rates of change, then solve for the required rate of change. All right. Table below lists examples of mathematical models involving time rates of change, okay? The velocity of a car traveling for an hour is 50 miles per hour. That's a dx dt is 50 miles per hour and t is one hour. Okay? t is one hour. This is rate dx dt or d, uh, whatever your variable is. Water being pumped into a swimming pool at the rate of 10 cubic feet per hour. So cubic feet is volume. This is dv dt is equal to 10 cubic feet per hour. Units are your friends. Pay attention to them. A gear is revolving at a rate of 25 revolutions per minute. One revolution is 2 pi radians. So it's uh, 25 revolutions per minute. That would be 2 pi revolutions per minute. So D, uh, theta dt is equal to uh, 50 pi, okay, radians per minute. So theta dt is 50 pi radians per minute. Population of bacteria, that's that picture we saw, is increasing at a rate of 2,000 per hour. 
You see 2,000 bacteria per hour, so D, A, D, P, D, X, D, P, I would say D, A, D, P, but whatever, is equal to 2,000 bacteria per hour. The per hour means it's D, P. Okay. You're talking about miles per gallon, then your, your independent variable would be gallons. That might be a, a volume or something like that. That's the end of 3.7. Great examples here, example three, example four, example five, example six. I uh, don't know how much your future studies are going to need those, but they're fun problems to do. But I, what I want you to do is 3.8. This is a, an incredibly useful section to do, 3.8. Now, it looks like we're going to get started on 3.8 now. It's 11.19, so we've got about 20 minutes left. We're not going to finish the section today, but we will finish it, I think, knock on wood, on Wednesday. And that means we will be, I'll try to have your test ready on Wednesday, which is going to be really hard to do uh, because I've got to get the schedule finished by Wednesday, too. Fall schedule finished by Wednesday, so it's going to be some late night oil, okay? So anyway. Watch the rest of this, and we'll pick up from here as we go. Okay. We'll go from current slide. And again, a chapter 3, differentiation. And there was the ripples in the pond, the growth of bacteria, all these fun things, uh, dropping the balls. Okay. 3.8 is Newton's method. Boy, Newton came up with so many things that were incredible. The objective here is one, approximate a zero of a function when it's a really difficult thing to do. Now, I don't know if you remember uh, back in Math 112, probably pre-calculus algebra, if you had to estimate a zero and it wasn't something that came out exactly, what you would do, you look, you find the value of the function that was negative and one that was positive, and then you split the difference and then you go with those two. Whichever of those was negative, positive, split, split the difference again, split the difference again, split the difference again, and keep going until you got tired of doing it, and it would be a pain in the neck. Okay? And I call that, like Dr. Maybe did, the method of exhaustion. You just get so tired of it. That's close enough. It's somewhere in there. Okay? Newton, when he developed calculus, he came up with a method to do this really, really quickly. Okay? called Newton method. The technique for approximating the real zeros of a function is called Newton's method, and it uses the tangent lines to approximate the graph of a function near the x-intercept. That's where, you know, it's all, um, the zeros of the function are the same as the x-intercept. Okay? So the key is to be able to get close to the given. You get close to begin with, Newton's method takes you there in very quick order. To see how Newton's method works, consider a function f that is continuous on this interval from a to b and differentiable on the interval from a to b, but not necessarily at the endpoint. Okay? If f of a and f of b differ in signs, and we knew that they did, then by the intermediate value theorem, you know there has to be a, at least one zero in the interval. If it's a continuous function and it's a negative down here, a positive up here, it's got to cross somewhere. Okay, if it's a continuous function. So if it's positive here and negative here, it's got to cross somewhere. Now it may cross a dozen times, but it's going to cross at least once. Okay, if it's a continuous function. Okay, to estimate that zero, you choose a value fairly close to it. Let's call it x of 1. Okay? Now, here's your a, here's your b. Pick an x somewhere in between. Not a or b, because you're not guaranteed the derivative is good there. You pick some value x of 1, you know the function's continuous there, so it's going to have a value, and you know it's differentiable, so it will have a derivative there. All right? So Newton's method is based on the assumption that the graph of f and the tangent line at x1, f of x1, both cross the x-axis close to each other. 
okay? Because if this function is coming down like this, its tangent line is coming down like that. So they are going to cross somewhere relatively close to each other. Maybe not exactly, but relatively. Okay? So, there's your first assumption. Pick a value x that you think is fairly close to the zero. You may not be right on it, but fairly close to it. And evaluate the function. Because you know the function, you have to know the function. Evaluate that at that first value, at zero. Okay? Then take the derivative of the function. You know the function, so take its derivative. Evaluate that slope at that same point. And then draw the line that goes through that. Find out where that line crosses the x-axis. That's your x2. That's your next step. Well, according to this picture, at x2, your function value is here. So evaluate f of x2. Then do your derivative from here. And that's going to get you back here somewhere. Okay? And that's going to be even closer to that point. And then you take this one and it gets closer. And closer. It zooms in on it like nobody's business. Okay? So that's the technique there. Because you can easily calculate the x-intercept for that tangent line, I'm saying you can anyway, you could use it as a second and usually better estimate of the zero for f. The tangent line passes through the point x1, f of x1, with the slope of f prime of x1. In the point slope form, the equation for the tangent line is that x minus f of x1 plus f prime of x1 times x minus f1. So, y, the new guess of what that would be, well, no, this, this y here. Just add this to both sides. It's y prime times x minus x1. y prime of x1 times x minus x1 plus f of x1. That's your y value. Okay? Now, if you set y is equal to 0 and solve for x, set this equal to 0, now you have f prime at x1 times x minus f prime of x1 times x1 plus f of x1. Solve this for x, you're going to uh, move this one to that side, that one to that side, and then divide by this. And that's a lot of blah, blah, blah. What you wind up is x. That produces x is equal to x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. So let's go back and see if that's the new truth. Uh, let me write it out. Otherwise, it's hard to follow. They skip too many steps here. So let me get my pen set up. So y is equal to f prime of x1 times x minus, I like to write the x in front, so I'm going to do x1 times f prime of x1, 1, plus f of x1. Okay? Now we're wanting to solve for this. Okay, we're going to set y equal to 0. That's where it's going to cross the x-axis, right? Okay? So y is equal to 0, so you have uh, x times f prime of x1, minus x1 times f prime of x1 plus f of x1. Okay. Now what I'm going to do here, since I want to solve for x, I'm going to put this on this side, Leave it where it is and add the other two. So x times f prime of x1 is equal to x1 times f prime of x1 plus a minus, because I moved it to the other side, minus f of x1. 
Okay? Then divide both sides by f prime of x1. Okay. These go out. These go out. Okay? So what you have is x is equal to x of 1 minus f of x of 1 over f prime of x of 1. So now I think you see why you don't want the first derivative to be 0. I can't divide by 0. But let's go back to our picture here. Surely you don't want the first derivative to be 0. Let's just say somewhere up here it's going to be 0. If you had that, it never crosses the x-axis. So be sure you don't pick a point x1 to be somewhere further. You have a hard time handling. Make sure you're somewhere on the slope going towards the 0. Okay? And then that gives you the formula you need. And here it is, just like we did. x is equal to x1 minus f, f of x1 over f, f prime of x1. So from the initial estimate, x1, you obtain a new estimate. Um, this will be your x2. Find your f of x2. And then your uh, x3 is going to be uh, x2 minus f of x2 over f prime. So you get your f prime here. So there you have x2 is x1. Uh, this, that gives you your x2 that was here. Do that again. And you'll go up here. Find the f of x2. There's your Whoa! You see, in no time, you're coming really, really close to that scene. Okay? There's your second estimate. Then your third estimate. And it's always the same. x of 3 is equal to x of 2 minus f of x2 over f prime of x2. You just have to keep calculating. You calculate f prime once and then plug in these different values. Repeated application of this process is called Newton's method. So here we have a synopsis of that. If that, if that wasn't simple enough, but here we go again. Um, let f of x, f of c equals zero, where f is a differentiable on an open interval containing that, that number c. Then to approximate the c, use these steps. Make an initial estimate x1 that is relatively close to c. A graph is helpful. If you have a graphing calculator or a graphing program on your computer, do it and see if you can get something close. Then determine a new approximation. Okay? Pick an x1, then your x of 2 is going to be your x1 minus f of x1 over f prime. Okay. So, what they sort of left out here, they gave you a function f, right? Take its derivative. Okay? You have the function f, you have its derivative. Okay? So, your new approximation x2 is your first approximation x1 minus f of x1. You just plug that in there. Now, prime of x1, plug that in your derivative. Do the subtraction, you get a new number. Okay? Then take that new number, put it here, plug it here, plug it here, subtract again. When x, when your difference between one estimate and the next estimate is within your desired accuracy, say you want it to three decimal places, as long as you get that less than 0 0.001, then stop. Okay? Um, let x of n minus 1, n plus 1, serve as a final approximation. Otherwise, return the step 2 and keep doing it again and again. Each successive application of this procedure is called an iteration. And if those iterations are getting closer to some point, you know you're going well. If they're going haywire, you pick the poor x1 to begin with. Okay? And we'll see some examples of that. Okay, so here's example one. Calculate three iterations of Newton's method to approximate the zero for of this function. f of x is equal x squared minus 2. Okay? Now, any of you want to hazard a guess of what uh, the zero is going to be? In other words, when f of x is equal to 0, what's your x going to be? 
looking at that, wouldn't you say square root of 2? And the square root of 2 is approximately 1.414. That's approximate. Okay? So let's see if we can get close. So we're going to use x01 equal 1. Yeah, that's pretty close to it. Okay? It's a square root function. Square root function looks like this. So yeah, you're going to be getting close to it. Okay? Uh, you don't have a lot of wiggles in that. You don't have any zero derivatives. So you should be fine. Okay. So. All right. What would you suggest the first thing we do? Second? Okay, isn't it rewritten okay right there for you? Okay, let's go with that. Then what do you do? What's the Jesus answer in this course? Take a derivative, okay? What's L prime of X? Pretty easy. Not a trick question. 2x, you got it. All right, now we've got that. We know our x of 1. x of 1 is 1. So x sub 2 is going to be what? x of 1, which is 1 minus f at 1. Okay, well, let's start doing this. F of 1 is equal to what? Not that hard. F of 1, plug it in right there, is equal to, help me, somebody. F of 1, plug in a 1 for the X. What do you get? Negative 1. And f prime of 1 is going to be, whoops, I don't need two equal signs. What's that going to be? Say again. 2. Got it. Okay. So let's plug and chuck. 1 minus, how did that go? Wasn't it f1, f of, f of x, which is, a minus 1 over 2. Well, that's going to be minus and minus is plus. That's going to be 1.5. Already, we're much closer to our real value than what we had before. Right? Okay. So let's do x sub 3. What's going to be your previous value? 1.5 minus. Now we're going to plug that 1.5 into f of x. So f of 1.5 is 1.5 squared minus 2. Anyone know what 1.5 squared is, by the way? No, not double squared. I think it's 2.25, isn't it? 15 squared is 225, if my memory's right. Okay, so the difference between that would be a positive right? 0.25. Okay, divided by f of 1.5, f prime of 1.5, that's going to be 3, right? 1 and a half, double that is 3, right? Yay or nay? Okay. So, pull out your calculator. 1.5 minus 0.25 divided by 3. I don't want to keep doing these in my head. It's not that hard, but it's just a pain in the neck. 1.5 minus 0.25 divided by 3. Now, let's see. I think this would call our first iteration. This is our second iteration. Okay. We'll do one more after this one. 
So what does this become? 1.5 minus 0.25 divided by 3. One point four one three. Second. Six next. Okay, I can't hear it. One point four one six. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I missed it. Okay. Four one six. Okay. Now here's what I want you to do. Whatever it is you have on your screen there, hang on to it. Okay, because your x sub 4 is going to be that number. So put that number, keep all those digits. 1.41, and you notice we're closer to our answer. Okay, minus, okay. Now here we might have to do some rounding. Uh, your f of 1.416 or whatever that rounded to be. Now, was your next digit after the 6 greater than 5 or less than 5? Oh, okay, so let's make that a 7. Okay. Okay. Make that a 7. So that thing squared uh, minus 2. So again, again, if you have that in your calculator and can save it, square it and subtract 2 from it. What does that give you? Second. Yeah, you square it, not square root, but square it. Your f squares this thing right here. 1.417 squared, and then subtract 2 from it. Zero point what? Zero, zero what? Okay, what was the first digit after the zero you said? Zero. Zero, zero. zero. Yeah, zero point zero zero. Six, and what? Six nine. Six, nine. Zero. Say again? Yes, four. 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 Okay, we'll leave it point six zero zero six nine four. That's squared, right? Yes. Subtract oh that's after you subtracted two from. Yes. Right. Okay. And that's a positive number. Okay, so it's uh, 0 0.00694. You see we're getting awfully close. Divided by 2 times this number here. That's going to be 2.834, approximately. If you got it saved in your calculator, you'll get it more precise than that. Do that for me, and what do you get? No. Okay, you're just doing the division. Okay, do this whole thing. 1.41, 1 .4, let's make that a 7, minus 0 0.00694 divided by What you get? Help me, somebody. Okay, I know we're running out of time. What's that again? Okay, wait, wait. Are you doing just this part here? Okay, I said do this minus that part. So whatever you got there, negate it and add to this. What do you get? Say again? Whatever number you got here, negate that, make it a minus, and add to that 1.417. Is this a 4 or a 9? I'm sorry? Is that a 4 or a 9? 2.839. 2.839. 
2.834. I've just doubled this number right here. This number right here. I don't think so. Okay, right. One point four one. Say again. Four one four. Look at what we got. You're right, almost on top of it. And we were doing the rounding. In the book, they carried it. Ooh. One, two, three, four, five, six decimal places. They wrote down the whole thing. And if they did, they came out. Well, they got 1.414216, and we're getting awfully close. Uh, square root of 2 was 1.414214. So, so six decimal places, we were awfully close to being correct. Okay? We'll begin next time with example 2. Let me give you some homework exercises here to go. And that will be, and there's not many of them, either 3 or 5, both at Calc Chat, 3's at Calc View. Any of the odds, 7 through 17, they're all at Calc Chat, 9's uh, at Calc View, and we'll pick up the rest of those next time. All right, good deal. Bring your calculators next time.